just when you thought you'd seen the summer's best film about a really tall magical alien with flying weapons who gets into conflict with an annoying little girl child, Hulu just dropped a surprise sequel to one of the most classic sci-fi action franchises of all time. Yes, the Predator is back. Oh, and he's ready to rumble. Hi guys, Perry here, and I'm going to be taking you behind the scenes to reveal never-before-seen secrets for the making of the new film Prey. Now we'll be talking all things spoilers from here on out, so if you have yet to see the movie, I suggest you pause the video here and subscribe to Hulu already. But if you're not a cheap git and have already watched the new masterpiece from the director of Cloverfield 2, then buckle up, because your mind is about to be blown when we reveal exactly how far the filmmakers went to get this movie made, as well as how much internal drama was actually going on up at the Canadian set. So without further ado, Let's strap on our plasma casters and get straight to the chopper. The director of the film, Dan Trachtenberg, had stated in recent interviews that Prey took four years to bring to the screen. With a long period of full starts as a revolving door of senior studio producers at 20th Century Fox, <laughs> ah, sorry, that is 20th Century Studios, all had differing takes on the direction the movie should go in. A big bone of contention was with the film's rating, as studio execs first agreed it could be rated R, then changed their minds to a PG-13, then bizarrely upgraded to a XXX rating when Harvey Weinstein got involved for a few months before leaving after being me too'd into oblivion, and the project resettled back into an R for the remainder of the production. Intriguingly, another delay to release was caused when location scouts found the perfect place to shoot in northwestern Texas, with historically accurate sites of where the Comanche natives used to reside and had settled in during the 18th century. However, many things put practicalities of shooting there in jeopardy, including current day politics when they were told in no uncertain terms by conservative state governor Greg Abbott that he would not allow movies promoting or involving the invasion of illegal aliens to be made in this state. And also, it was really fucking hot. So production eventually found its way up to the Canadian city of Calgary, with producers choosing to film in the stony Nakoda Nation's ancestral lands for authenticity purposes. Further delays were incurred, however, when Chief Elder of the Bearspaw First Nation, David Bearspaw, said they could only film on their lands between 9pm and 3am, and only if the crew spent a few bucks in the stony Nakoda casino before they left. Director of Photography Jeff Cutter pushed back on this ultimatum, mainly due to the fact that they needed to shoot a bulk of daytime scenes too, and also because his wife had banned him from stepping foot in casinos after he'd gone in deep with Mad Dog Mike for gambling debts and now she controls access to his wallet. Tensions were eased, however, when the part native ensemble of actors assured the chief that they would respect the sanctity of the ancestral lands, and would always urinate in plastic water bottles if they ever got caught short, and totally not up the side of any sacred cottonwood trees. The chief was impressed by this, and finally agreed to let the production film from 9pm to 9am, and the crew ended up spending a fortune in the casino on the way out in gratitude. During the early scene where one of the tribesmen is hurt, the props team tried out all sorts of natural adhesives in order for the characters to create a makeshift stretcher using only natural elements found in the surrounding forest. Though no such tree bark would work exactly as they needed it to, and so instead they cheated a bit and gave the actors a pack of orange flavour hubba bubba gum, which they chewed before scenes and then pretended to strip off as some tree trunk when cameras began rolling. Luckily, it did the trick nicely, and they almost single-handedly kept the billion dollar Wrigley Corporation in business after a particularly difficult lockdown period for the company. The sequence where main character Naru is stuck in a muddy bog wasn't actually scripted. It was in fact the result of a horrific onset accident which occurred when the small crew were walking through the secluded part of the forest to get to the mountain to shoot the night scenes and nobody seemed to notice they were currently wading through a giant swamp. When actress Amber Midthunder soon found herself neck deep in the mud, panicked production assistants who were already exhausted from carrying all the gear suddenly scattered in all different directions trying to find help and radio base camp on their walkie talkies. Fortunately, the crew's GoPro helmet cams were still rolling when they dropped all the equipment to the floor before they ran off, and so what you see in the finished film is the actress's real attempt to save her own life. Breaking reports suggest that the traumatised actress is now suing the Fox production and seeking millions in damages for quote, almost letting me drown in a puddle of shite. 
in a rare show of inclusivity for the typically ableist Predator franchise, the E.T. Hunter himself is actually supposed to be a disabled member of his species, and according to the shooting script, is described as having an alien form of Down Syndrome, hence why his disturbing face is designed to look like it's missing a chromosome. Between native actors, elderly actors, and mentally handicapped illegal aliens, this film checks so many boxes for diversity and inclusivity quotas that it may be one of the few movies released this year that actually has a shot at being able to be nominated for an Oscar at next year's ceremony. The reason why the native characters appear to be talking English in this film is simply because they are, as the producers couldn't be bothered to put all 120 pages worth of dialogue into Babelfish.com, especially when they realised that Google Translate doesn't offer an instant converter service for quote, Cherokee Injun shit. Eagle-eyed fans will notice that the Predator doesn't use his plasma caster once in this movie, mainly because he recently lost his virginity in what was a very awkward experience for the poor alien fella, and was now always paranoid about quote, blowing his load too early. Speaking of gangly alien fellas, the Predator in this film is played by 6 foot 9 Italian-American actor Dane DiLiegro. DiLiegro is an ex-professional basketball player, and you probably know him best as being the only honky in the NBA. In a rather bizarre and surprising twist, the killer bear in the first act was played by none other than Leonardo DiCaprio in an elaborate fursuit who demanded a chance to perform the other side of a bear attack after his infamous experiences whilst filming The Revenant, a film which left him so traumatised that he felt that he needed to be the one terrorising a small girl in order to get over his past experiences, and also to stop the haunting nightmares about getting ripped to shreds by a giant fuck-off bear in the middle of a frozen wood. Early Bars indicates that Leo is up for a BAFTA award after ignorant Brits were totally impressed at how he transformed himself into the role of a quote, giant beaver. As briefly mentioned earlier, the movie's lead actress is called Amber Midthunder. Contrary to public assumption, this isn't because she's part native and has taken on a traditional title, but simply because of the fact that she was born slap bang in the middle of a raging thunderstorm and her parents were still too cold and shaken to think straight when signing her birth certificate only a few hours later though Amber herself has never brought herself to change it, as apparently it's good for grifting as a minority to boost one's career, and also it gives her something to talk about at parties. The luminous green ooze used to denote the predator's blood was actual toxic slime scraped off a New York City sewer system, which infamously turned four escaped baby turtles into the badass teenage mutant ninjas they are today. According to a production runner on the set, an exasperated crew had to deal with hundreds of tiny woodland creatures mutating to monstrous sizes and trying to eat up all their expensive equipment. One insider source swears he saw a four foot vole try to gnaw the muff off a short boom mic. Thus the set had to be cordoned off by the end of filming and a special team of macrobiologists brought in to demutantize the local wildlife. Though legends say the film's gaffer smuggled out a gaggle of giant beetles in his undies to sell on the black market. Authorities warn that if you see a seller called Big Bucks For You pop up on eBay, be very wary of doing business with the person. Ditto any accounts called Real Life Big Bad Beetleborgs. The merch he will offer you is technically stolen goods, and you might just get more than you bargained for. According to the official novelization of the movie, the skull helmet the Predator wears is actually that of his older brother Clark, whom he was forced to slay a few years back when he found his bro in his bed and fondling the face pincers of his beloved fiancée Klieger. The book goes on to describe how the Predator burst into tears at the sight of such betrayal, but only started physically thumping on his brother when Clark implied he wasn't a real man and could never satisfy, quote, that dutty hoe, and even proceeded to make derogatory facial impressions and called him the alien equivalent of a mongoloid. This tipped the Predator over the edge and he swiftly whipped down his Beyblade and decapitated his older sibling in a fit of rage, skinning off the still warm flesh and then dropping a steaming deuce into his bare skull. Shagging his missus was one thing, but mocking a warrior's intrinsic disability was simply too far. Especially when his so-called brother knew what he went through as a child, when the Predator's schoolmates saw used to point and laugh at his droopy face and lack of a chromosome. Aww. 
During post-production screenings, the final shot of the film was rather controversial, with some test audiences noting that the actress looked too uncomfortable in the luminous green facial makeup, whilst others advised that it may not be a good idea to end your film with a heroine looking like she's just sucked off the Incredible Hulk. For better or worse, director Dan Trachtenberg swiftly overruled them. So there you have it, 12 behind the scenes secrets of the making of the latest Predator film. So what say you? Were you surprised by any of the revelations revealed by our sources? What was your favourite fact? And how did this instalment live up to other Predator movies, like casting Couch Babe 17 or anything made by the Weinstein Company? Let us know down in the comments. And remember to like, share and subscribe for more cursory content for your consumptory goodness. I've been Perry Winklewaffer and always remember, if it looks too good to be true, just give it a suck and hope for the best.